That constitution was put in the 1995 constitution because of myself, because of me. I'm the one who actually who influenced and shaped it being there. It was tabled by Mayombo. I am the one who sent him a message. I had a background. As a researcher, of course, we were not talking, but I had a background that President Habib Bojib of Tunisia had become senile in office and nearly led to a crisis in Tunisia because he could appoint a minister. The following day, when the minister comes to see him, he would say, who are you? What have you come to do by the way? Until the vice, his vice president and other officials picked him and took him to his house, and the vice president took over. But much more important, I had a foundation and a background. I come from the former kingdom of Mpororo. There was a kingdom in a pre-colonial period in Uganda called Mpororo Kingdom. It was actually the biggest, the largest in Uganda then. It included the president in Tungamo district, president in Kunjiri district, president in Chiga district, president in Shema district, President Bushenyi district, or, uh, and some parts of Rwanda. It was a large kingdom. Why did it go? For the first time in the history of kingdoms, it disappeared, disintegrated without invasion, without a rebellion. Why? The king then, Kahaya Rutindangezi, had ruled and become maybe 90 years, become senile. His sons wanted him to leave office. He refused until it disintegrated in his hands, and it just disappeared. Now the people of Mpororo Kingdom are form of a horror. Can you imagine an identity disappeared because of scenarios of a head of state, a head of kingdom then? So from that I advised that it was put there, and it was passed. Let me go to what I, I was supposed to present today. I wanted to give you that, thing, that, that background. Uh, Constitutional amendments in Uganda and assessment, but with a question, why have the constitutions in Uganda failed the test of time? As you know, constitutions in Uganda have failed a test of time. I will hurry because there is no time. Definition of a constitution, we are not going to go into de details about that. A constitution is a system of basic principles, rules, and organizational arrangements. A constitution is a body of fundamental principles, norms, and laws that guide the government. Some countries have written constitutions and others have unwritten constitutions, but the best thing is that all countries have constitutions. There are some who say UK doesn't have a constitution or Israel or New Zealand, that is not true. They have a constitution only that it is not written. But even our pre-colonial societies and kingdoms had constitutions, but they were not written. They were in their hearts. They were norms, and there is no society, organized society, that doesn't have that. Some countries have institutionalized them into one document, and for others, it is found in different laws, conventions, and codes. The constitution is the highest law of the land. Those are just statements. Constitutionalism. Constitutionalism is about the balancing the letter and the spirit of the constitution. Constitutionalism is in the spirit, is in the values, in the norms. A constitution should not be just about the articles and clauses, but also the spirit behind these articles. There are those who say the, uh, it is well laid down in the constitution. It is very clear in the constitution. No, it is not clear. And there are those who take the constitution to be only the written clauses and articles and subsections written words. Do you remember those of you who have read the Bible? It doesn't matter whether you are Christian or not, but most people have read the Bible. You know how Jesus castigated the Pharisees? The Pharisees were those who were referring to the law as written on the paper, not as law written in their hearts. And Jesus said, no, what is important is not the law as written, it is law as is in the hearts, as in norms and values and principles. And therefore, those who always refer to the constitution, the constitution are like the Pharisees that, uh, who refer to the law as written. 
We want the law as written in the hearts of the people, therefore a spirit of constitutionalism. What is the letter of the law saying and what is the spirit of the law saying? Such that our judges shouldn't just be like our Pharisees. When they are making constitutional judgments, they should also refer to the spirit of the law. They should go and check with the Hansard to find out those who made the constitution what they had in mind when they put their age limit or term limit or indeed other laws. Otherwise, merely by going by the letter of the constitution is missing the point. Constitution, I would just, in the context of Uganda, the constitution is an instrument of nation and state building, building inclusive, equal, and cohesive societies. The constitution is an instrument of democratization. The constitution can be an instrument of conflict resolution. Conflict resolution, let me make a point here. Not suppressing conflicts. You know, sometimes when a regime suppresses conflicts and contains them, it, say, it thinks that there are no conflicts. No. The conflicts are not resolved through coercive machinery. The conflicts are not resolved through hard power. The conflicts are resolved through soft power. Have you convinced everybody to be on board? Is there a political consensus in the country? Have people accepted to live together? Is the state legitimate in the hearts of the people? Otherwise, merely suppressing conflicts and you think everything is okay is like the proverbial ostrich which hid its head in the sand and thought people were not looking at it. The constitution is an instrument of power sharing and distribution. The constitution is an instrument of, sub, of establishing a just economic political order. The constitution can be used as, as an instrument of distributing and regulating power among different branches and levels of government. And the constitution establishes how a state can exercise power. And the constitution regulates the relationships between the citizens and the state. I would have elaborated there, but we don't have time. Let's look at the foundational principles, norms, and values for constitutional amendment processes, because this seminar here was convened to look at issues of constitutional amendments and how we can forge a way forward. So let's look at foundational principles, norms, and values for constitutional amendment process. Let me first make this comment. The South African Constitution, which has been one of the best constitutions around, before it was promulgated, actually before it was made, they had first to agree on principles. They had 34 principles. They first agreed on the principles before they started deliberation. And they agreed that after the constitution has been promulgated, it would have to, be, to have a judicial review where the judiciary, the constitutional court, would look at the constitutional provisions and scrutinize it, find out whether they were aligned to the principles agreed upon. Otherwise, if you write a constitution without agreeing on principles, that constitution can be violated without recourse to any checklist. So, these include, I mean the foundational norms, but are not limited to citizens' genuine participation and not participated. I have popularized this concept in the public sphere of being participated. Participating and being participated are two different things. You can be called for a meeting like this one and you sign a document and they say you have participated when actually you were participated by the organizers. So a constitution should not be made in a way, in such a way that you participate citizens. They should participate genuinely, not be participated. It should have inclusivity, respect of popular sovereignty of the people, rule of law. It should be conflict of interest free. This is a very important norm. Conflict of interest free. If you amend a constitution in such a way that actually you are amending it to serve you as an individual, then 
that constitution has not stood on firm ground. Others are common or public good. It should be amended in order to promote public good, not selfish or individual interest or private good. It should be for justice for all, unity in diversity, because Uganda is a heterogeneous country. We need to accept pluralism and accept that we should have unity in diversity, broad consensus, shared values, justice, equality for all, fairness, fairness free from manipulation. You can have people participate, but you participate them through manipulating them. We don't want a constitutional amendment or constitutional making where citizens are manipulated and therefore participated. There needs to be checks and balances, separation of powers, civility, norms of civility, not in militarism. It should be corruption-free. Huh? Corruption-free. You, our members, not necessarily these ones we are here, but members of parliament, in the past, when constitutional amendments were taking place, they were paid, and they accepted money, and went. And do you think those are going to make a genuine constitution? But that is even payment. They are, they, you can also be bribed politically. You can have political co corruption. Most people think corruption is about embezzlement of funds. No, you can abuse office also. And we are going to see it below when we come to each of these constitutions. I'm going to elaborate more below. The constitution. A constitution making an amendment should also be based on political ethics. Political ethics are missing in Uganda, we have been missing. These include, but are not limited to conflict of interest I talked about, honesty. People are not honest. I might miss mentioning this one because of time. Let me mention about honest. When they were amending, when the parliament was amending the, the constitution for the age limit, the age limit uh, uh, provision, I went and actually had, uh, 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 exchanged views with the, the committee, the legal committee. And I told them, they were telling me, but we are legal. We, you know, they were Pharisees now. But we are legal, we are the ones supposed to make this uh, amendment, what is your problem? Now, I told them, but you are not honest. Why were they not honest? They were saying, they were urging, that they were amending the constitution because they didn't want provisions that make the constitution rigid. So I reminded them that that article, is it 101? Was it 101 or something like that? The same article where there was age limit, there was also education limit. In the same article, there was education limit besides age limit. There was also another limit uh, where they would limit a candidate from standing. So I told them, if you are honest, why don't you suggest that all those articles, clauses be removed because they were limiting, because they were not honest, they were dishonest. Respect for human dignity, integrity, corruption-free, manipulation-free, it is I had talked about them. Makers or viewers of constitution should be statesmen and women who look at building for the next generation and not politicians looking at the next election. I will be commenting a little bit about, for example, the constitution amendments that have taken place throughout Uganda in history. Are you looking at the next elections or the next generations? In most cases, they have looked at the next elections. Now let's go through a timeline of Uganda's constitutions. From around 1958, the process of making the constitution began. There was the Wild Committee report. I don't know how many of us have read the Wild Committee report. A committee read by Wild, somebody called Wild, a gentleman called Wild. Uh, uh, which was preparing for the form of government and elections that would take place in 1961. It was chaired by Wiley, but it, was, it had Africans on it, especially members of the Legislative Council there, then who were Africans. 
the likes of Milton Obote were on this constitutional uh, 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 process of, of wives. Then, then in 1961, there was a Musta Commission report, equivalent to Odochi report. It was the Uganda Relationships Commission, Commission report. I wish most of you politicians can read that one. When you read it, you could predict that there would be constitutional instability in Uganda. That, 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 that commission report was very clear about the confusion in Uganda, led by Lord Musta. It is the one which ushered in the 62 elections, the independence, I mean, the independence, constitutional and independence elections. Now, in 1963, was the first amendment of the 1962 Constitution. Let me make a correction. There might be some people here who have been making a mistake, a mistake like those I have seen even in the media. There are those, I wanted to ask you a question by the way, but you are too, too large. I wanted to teach now and see how many people knew. There are those who think that Kabaka Mutensa became the president of Uganda in 1962 at independence. It's wrong. He became the president in 1963 after the 62 constitution was amended. Otherwise, between 1962 and 63, the governor general remained as the head of state. That is a mistake that people have been making, and I want to correct it here. Now, that, that was the first amendment of the 62 constitution. And then in 1966, the constitution of 62 was abrogated. Another mistake I have seen in the media and the public sphere. They think that the Pigeon Hall Constitution was a 67 Constitution. Wrong. The Pigeon Hall Constitution was a 1966 Constitution, not 67. The 66 Constitution was meant to be an interim Constitution. Then it was replaced by the 1967 Republican Constitution, which was drafted by the executive presented to Parliament, which sat as a constituent assembly, debated it for about one month, and passed it. So the 67 constitution is not the pigeon hole. The 67 constitution was debated by Parliament. But let me make a comment on Parliament before I forget. You, members of Parliament, I am glad I'm talking to you today. You have accepted to be used by the executive, Parliament of Uganda has been corrupted, has been rubber stamped. Now, the 1967 constitution was debated and passed by a parliament, a first of all, 66. The 66 constitution was presented to parliament. It was in the Pigeon Hall, that's why it is called the Pigeon Hall. And the members of parliament were asked to pick the draft in their Pigeon Hall and pass it, and members passed it, without debating it. The only few debates that were there, a member of parliament would stand up and say, even if I have not read the constitution, I support it. Come on! You have not read and you support, so what are you supporting? Members of parliament, <laughs> that I have supported it, what have you supported now? Anyway, it was passed in one day. That is 66. 67. The 1967 constitution was debated and promulgated by members of parliament who sat as a constituent assembly. And you know what they did? If you don't know, members of parliament extended themselves into office for another five years without going for elections. Members of parliament. Is the parliament of Uganda serious? They, they said now, we don't want to go for elections. Since you have given us an opportunity, we have been extended for five years. That means it was illegal. They extended themselves illegally. And then, and then the president, who had become a president after pro, uh, abrogating the 67 constitution, uh, 66 constitution, was also extended in office for another five years without going for elections by the members of parliament. 
elected by the people, honorable members. What is that now? I have told you, maybe that is the politics they got away. In 1971, Oh, but uh, Idi Amin came in, for him he didn't pretend to be democratic. There was no pretense. He just abolished the constitution. Ah, let me rule with the, uh, by decrees I am the constitution and everything. So the constitution was abolished. Although I'm told somewhere, somehow, he was using that constitution. It, it, it appeared as if he abolished it, but he was using it behind. He abolished certain things that limited his power. In 1979, the 1967 constitution was reinstated, but with provisions arbitrarily uh, suspended under legal notice number one of 1979. So the constitution was reinstated, but with amendment without consulting the people, of course. In 1985, some provisions of the 67 constitution were also suspended by NRM uh, in 1986, sorry. Legal notice number one suspended some parts of the 1967 constitution without, of course, consulting anybody, the, 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 the citizens. Now, in 1995, a new constitution was promulgated, but the 1995 constitution has had more than 100 amendments. Somebody, I think, was talking about 119 or so amendments in a period of less than three decades. Other constitutions have lasted 200 years and amended about nine times. Uganda's constitution, within less than two decades, was amended by more than 100 times. Is that still the constitution? Another influence I had in the constitution, by the way, let me tell you, through uh, the late Honorable uh, Adokonechon, I think. I also sent a message to him to the effect that RDCs are very important people at the district and they wield a lot of power and influence. Why should we have anybody as RDC? So I proposed to him that an RDC should be somebody who qualifies to be a senior public servant. A senior public, pub, uh, senior public servant qualified by the Public Service Commission. What do I see now? It was removed. It is now open-ended. Anybody can jump very high and become an RDC. That, that, those are the, 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 the challenges we have had. Let's make some small assessments and we'll complete as uh, we don't have time. Decision on making process and amendment processes in Uganda. Uganda has been defined by constitutional instability in its 60 years, 60 years of independence. Constitutional instability. It is against that background that actually the 1995 constitution was made. I think in the preamble it says, recalling the political instability in Uganda, the citizens hereby, but we have forgotten about that preambular statement, recalling our history of political and constitutional instability, we just make amendments as if there has not been constitutional instability. We have read history without learning from history, unfortunately. The Ugandan constitutions have failed a test of time. Ideal constitutions are not supposed to be amended easily just like it is done for the ordinary laws. But in Uganda, we just wake up and amend the constitution. That creates constitutional instability. This instability is partly to, blame, to be blamed on the constitutions which were based on shake foundations which are called maram. You know a maram road? In a Maram road like these ones of, of my friend there, uh, the, road, the Lord Mayor uh, uh, and, uh, he, uh, 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 and his friend, uh, 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 called, she's called what? Saka? Hey, there are Maram roads in Kampara. You know, when it rains, just once, 
the rain is off. That's a maram constitution. Maram foundations. Instead of concrete, foundation. If you write a constitution, amend a constitution, based on maram foundation, then it will be washed away. But if you write it on concrete foundations, then it will, test, it will stand a test of time. Unfortunately, our constitutions have been written and amended on a maram foundation, like the roads of my, the, 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 the streets of my friend there. Ma <laughs> Not meant for you. <laughs> the maram, really, maram, not concrete. The 1962 constitution was based on maram foundations. It was a constitution based on, on compromises than, rather than principles. It was less participatory. There was no integrity. There was manipulation. I'm talking about the 62 constitution. Those who manipulated the constitution, especially were those in power, mainly the colonial state, the, the, the British government. The British government manipulated that constitution of 1962. You know, people went to Lancaster. I don't know why they were removed from Uganda, but even in other dependencies, they used to be removed. Now you have this same peasant person, a primary teacher, going to Lancaster, traveling an airplane for the first time, is in London, and he's mesmerized by the whatever, the environment, and you expect that person to make a constitution? And he starts listening to the colonial secretary speaking English through the nose, and you know. And then there was that Bishop of Canterbury, I'm an Anglican, I'm not talking about him because I'm against the Archbishop, the Archbishop of Canterbury was manipulating, was very powerful because he didn't want to leave a Catholic at the helm of power in Uganda. The Archbishop of Canterbury, the Secretary of Colonies, and another powerful force was the Uganda Kingdom. They manipulated DP and Chiwanuka until the constitution was a maram Chiwanuka constitution of 1963. We are not going to go into the details of 62, sorry. There was a lot of manipulations. The 1963 amendment was based on injustice. It was not participatory, no consultations. There was conflict of interest. It was full of manipulations. Did not consider the context of Uganda. I'm talking about the amendment in 1963, when it was amended in such a way that they put a provision that the president of Uganda would be erected from para, uh, by parliament as a constituent college from among the traditional leaders of Uganda. That is the day when every community had a traditional leader. Even the Bachiga who didn't have, they had Rutachirwa. Even the Bajiso who had, they had Umukuka. Even the Rangi who didn't have, they had somebody with ostrich feathers. You know? Everybody became monarchized in order to be like Uganda. It was a copycat syndrome. You know, even those who didn't have monarchical state, they all of a sudden became monarchized. Why? Because they wanted also in the future to have a presidential candidate. Why would a tribal leader be the president of Uganda at the same time? Why weren't Ugandans allowed everybody to stand as president? Why for me, a commoner who is not common, would not in the future stand as the president of Uganda because I had somebody to represent me because he was a king? That was unjust. It was not participatory. And therefore, it was on the Maram Foundation. And no wonder it was abrogated in Skisesik. There was a conflict of interest. There were manipulations. And did not consider heterogeneity of Uganda. We could go on and on and on and on. Oh. The amendment was not steeped in known and consensus, uh, uh, in known principles. There should be principles there. And there was no consensus agreed upon on principles and norms. Why did the presidency remain among traditional leaders and to be elected only by parliament and not by 
by society. But also this business of Westminster model, where you have a president and a prime minister, I think was not suitable for Africa. Indeed, where it was left, whether in Zimbabwe or in Africa, whether in Kenya or wherever, it was later removed. Where, where you would have a constitutional head of state together with a prime minister who was executive. By the way, there are those who make a mistake and think that Obote in 1962 up to 66 was a mere prime minister. Obote was not a Nabanja. Obote was not a Rugunda. Obote was not a, 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 a Namama Babazi. Obote was an executive prime minister, the one who actually appointed ministers and could even disappoint them. He had control over security forces. He was an executive prime minister, like you have the executive prime minister in the UK. Not the head prefect of ministers. The executive person, and then you put the ceremonial head of state with all the powers, two bulls in one car, in the African setting, it was not easy to survive. And it didn't survive. It didn't put the context of Uganda in mind. So, anyway, that was the three amendment, and it did not stand the test of time. It was abrogated by Obote, the executive prime minister in 1966, and he just abolished, he just abrogated the constitution. Complete. He had just abolished it because he had a quarrel. He had an exchange with the, 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 the Kabaka, the, the Kabaka who doubled as the president of Uganda. It was not easy for Kabaka, by the way, I appreciate his position. To be a leader of a tribe and be the president of Uganda at the same time, it was not easy to balance the two. Indeed, in 1964, there was a referendum in the Lost Counties in Buyaganda Bugangezi, Chibari district now, and the Kagadi, and the people voted to go back to Unyoro, and the president refused to assent to the referendum results. And the prime minister said, since you have refused, I am going to sign. And therein, they had a conflict. Two bulls in one crowd, and they couldn't survive. They fought each other because in the UK, for example, they have had a lot of time to internalize that value but it could not work here. So the constitution was abolished. I'm not going to go to the history of what happened. Uh, and I have already told you how it was passed in parliament without people reading it. Definitely it was not consultative. It was based on Maram Foundation. It did not pass any democratic principles, but it was supposed to be a stopgap measure. The process was unconstitutional and democratic and procedural and principled and civil. There was no separation of powers, etc. etc. That was 66. Ah, 67 now, the Republican constitution. But did you hear even Uganda's constitutions, how they are called? Independence constitution, Pigeon Hall constitution, Republican constitution, Museveni's constitution. Hey, when shall we have a Ugandan constitution? That's how we name them Independence, Pigeon Hall. Republican, Orobote, and Museven Constitution. The 67 Constitution making and amendment process violated many constitutional principles and norms. There was no consultation with the people. The draft was made by the executive, debated by the parliament, which had expired. But because they wanted to extend themselves without going to the people, you may think that was 67. Eh? Is that so? Do you know this last parliament? It was the 11th or 10th parliament? 10th, you were there. Eh? And you passed a constitutional amendment to the effect that you have extended your term by another, for seven years. Yeah? Self-interest. Self-interest. These members of parliament think we are not following up on them. They extended themselves. What else would they have done? But the constitutional court squashed it. But, but they were repeating the 67 one. You see? They have learned history without learning from history. 
the term of the executive and the parliament had expired. So it was by illegal, it was made by illegal organs anyway. There was a conflict of interest as both the president and the parliament had self-interest in extending themselves into office without seeking for another mandate from the population. This was a typical case of political corruption. It was unethical. The constitution was later abolished in 1971 by Idi Amin, who never pretended to be democratic. He had learned from his predecessor, Obote, how to violate constitution, constitution with impunity. For him, he, he never pretended that he was a democrat. The UNRF government now, Uganda National Liberation Front government of, 17, of 79, amended the 67 constitution in 1979 by issuing legal notice number one of 1979 and continued with the 67 constitution. It was a takeover of government and a revolution. Anyway, when you take over government, you suspend certain constitutions through legal notice number one of that year. Ah, and you rule. There was another takeover in June of 1979 without regard for constitutional arrangement. Bina, uh, uh, Rurya was removed after being in power for 68 years. Days, Days sorry. <laughs> Days. I'm told he, 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 that record was broken by this lady of UK. Otherwise, it was the first record in the world. Liz. There was another takeover in 1980 by Muwanga, who said that it was not a military takeover, but some kind of takeover. There was no constitutional consideration. And there was that constitutional instability in that short period of UNRF period. The 1967 constitution was again amended by the legal notice number one of 1986 by NRM revolutionaries with no regard for constitutional principles or procedures. It was simply, they used the 67 constitution, but with that radical change using legal notice number one without consulting anybody. There was no parliament even. Later, by that legal notice, they constituted a new parliament, the National Resistance Council. And you remember the National Resistance Council, the, the, the speaker of the National Resistance Council was President Museveni. Did you know that? If you are counting the speakers of Uganda's parliament in our history, President Museveni was a speaker. He was the president, executive head, at the same time, the speaker of parliament. That was the NRC. That prepared the 1995 constitution. How could that parliament pass, they used to pass what? What, what were they called, those laws? They were not ordinances. The British ones were called ordinances. These ones were called what? NRC what? Statutes. So that is under that circumstance. The Constitutional Committee, the constitution, there was a Constitutional Committee, you remember the Odoti Committee, was, which did consultations and made the recommendations, the draft, but it was partisan. The Constitutional Committee members were appointed by the government, by the executive. And I think all of them, except one, were NRM activists. But even the DP who was there had been labeled as a good DP. You know, when President Museveni calls somebody a good DP, what it means. So there was a good DP who joined the NRM people. How? Appointed on the Constitutional Committee, and he was a good DP. The CA delegates were elected, that is true, but under, uh, under the, 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 the movement system Re and restrictions of parties. Parties were restricted. The CA, the, CA, the Constituent Assembly, was chaired by the late Wapakaburo and NRM original and uh, Professor Mwaka as the vice, and NRM also. 
and all the committees were chaired by NRM people. And they said this was inclusive constitution. That was the Maram Foundation. There were walks out, even at one time NRM walked out. There was opposition woke up, yeah. At one time, they were, they, I don't remember the incident, but also there is a time NRM delegates also walked out. That means there was no consensus. They are walked out, and some delegates were uh, boycotted the signing. See, some delegates didn't sign that constitution, that original document. That means there was no consensus, and therefore, shake a foundation, the Maram Foundation. There was no minimum consensus among the delegates. Amendments now of the 1995 Constitution. The 1995 Constitution has undergone several amendments in a very short time. A Constitution as the basic law is not supposed to be amended so frequently. Amendments should be the exception and not the rule. Instead now, amendments have been taken as the rule rather than the exception. The frequency of amendments tantamount amount to violation of the Constitution. The Constitution has been amended several times under the same government that presided over its making. And before the articles within this Constitution were operationalized or tested, they are said to have been found wanting and amended. Some amendments, some articles, such as the term and age limits, were amended at the instigation of the incumbent, who had, of course, vested interest, and the MPs who also had vested interest. The MPs who amended the age limit were conflicted because they were also interested in the extension of their term in office. During consultations, MPs were paid consultation allowance, which amounted to political corruption, therefore unethical. As we conclude, what ought to be done, or what ought to be a process of making a concrete constitution, not a maram constitution? By and large, actually, I have not gone into details here, but one can refer to, refer to our checklist of the principles and the norms and the values that guide the making of a constitution. The South African people were wise to first agree on a consensus basis on principles, then start the constitution making, and afterwards they agreed before they made the constitution that actually the constitutional draft should now be taken to, 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 to the constitutional court for judicial review to see whether it was aligned to the principles they had agreed upon. And therefore, those who are making the constitution were aware and conscious that there is another body which is going to look at this document based on the agreed upon principles. But our Ugandan one was not. Scholars have suggested there is a scholar by the way in Makere who has just recently graduated for a, with a PhD in the constitutional making and the amendment exercise, I think a certain Dr. Nick, Nixon, Wamameo, or somebody like that, who wrote a, a PhD on this issue. He needs to be consulted because he has taken much more time on, 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 on it. And such as scholars have suggested that before and during the processes of minding the constitution, certain prerequisites must be in place that the amendments must be guided and steeped in the constitutional foundation principles, norms, standards, and rules agreed upon before. There should also be a checklist for political ethics. This just, uh, checklist should be guaranteed by the judiciary, an independent body. Therefore, the amendments should, should first undergo a judicial review before enacted or promulgated into a constitution. I want to end by proposing, if you find it fit, 
that a checklist of foundational principles of the Constitution be prepared by some members of Parliament, maybe with the assistance of some technical experts, you who are gathered here, you can prepare that, those foundational principles and they are lay, laid on the table in the Parliament. And if adopted, they become a guide for future constitutional amendments. Can I repeat it? If it is your liking, the members of Parliament should agree on foundational principles and norms of constitutional making and, democ and constitutional democracy, and then lay them on the table. And if it is in the liking of Parliament, they are adopted. And whenever there would be a constitutional amendment, you refer to them as a checklist. And anything that is done in that constitution by way of amendment that does not conform to the principles and the ethics of democracy and constitutional processes is null and void. I think that way it would help the constitutional amendment people to have a checklist on themselves so that there is a check on their selfishness or their unethical behavior or whatever because there is a checklist to check these people who otherwise are politicians who are looking at the next direction not the next generation as Sante San. A round of applause for Professor Andevesa. And we'd like to appreciate you for always being available. It usually appears also in the preamble of our constitution. How about reinforcing some of these very, very, very important articles? For example, like when we talk about, about uh, the term limits, if term limit was reinforced, what do you think about it? It's just a question. Eh? Thank you. Thank you. Lanya, once again. Uh, Professor, I would like to appreciate you for a wonderful presentation. And I have one concern to put across about constitutional manipulation. You explained so well how constitution has been manipulated in this country to suit the interest of an individual that is President Yoweri Museveni. And if you have been following how NRM government has been manipulating members of parliament through bribery, intimidation, like in the 10th parliament, and a lot of nonsense to make sure members of parliament pass the constitution in favor of President Yoweri Museveni. My question is, as a professor, and you are one of the opponents of the 1995 Constitution, what should we do as opposition to make sure we overcome such kind of manipulation? Aware that in the 10th Parliament, opposition voted against the seven years extension. And from your explanation, you are talking generally as if all members of parliament supported the seven years extension. And finally, aware that the current opposition, we came up with what we call legislative agenda. And I would like you to advise us what we put in a legislative agenda, if adopted by this government, would really push Uganda far away. What should we do as opposition 
to make sure our issues are respected by Uganda and especially the current government of NRM, which is manipulating us. I beg to move. Brief one, and it is uh, on, the on the presentation of what ought to be done. And your last point on uh, the judiciary, Gar being uh, the, the principles, the norms to be guaranteed by the judiciary. Unfortunately, Professor, as a country, this is one arm of the government that is lacking in a lot of things, and I don't know how best, if I don't know whether we, we don't have another alternative apart from the judiciary to help us with this, otherwise, how best can we as a country operate in this because we we have lost actually even trust in the judiciary you're talking of parliament but i think the three arms all have to to be worked on what else needs to be done apart from the judiciary thank you so much thank you lucy can we have uh, the honorable goreth namoga after that uh, the professor will respond to those we'll go in uh, another round and then we'll go for a break Thank you so much, moderator, and I'm the Shadow Minister for Science, Innovation, and Technology in the Alternative Government. Yes, Honorable Minister. So, um, Professor, you've ably mentioned about we should be statesmen and women building for the next generation, not for the next elections. And for me, promotion of public awareness of the Constitution. Professor, the Constitution is very clear that the state shall promote public awareness of this constitution. I think this has been neglected. Much as we are working for the interest of the public, but they are not aware of what we are talking about. So are we working for them all for ourselves? For me, I think it's very important that as we do these constitutional reforms and uh, this important assignment, we should also take it up to ensure that either us or the government takes up this assignment of ensuring that the people, the public, is aware of the Constitution and their contribution towards ensuring that all these articles within the Constitution are put to good use. Thank you. Honorable Abbasman Basari Rafojema, those will be in our panel discussion after the presentation of the Honorable Dan Wandera Ogalo. Can we have uh, the Lord Mayor? Uh, thank you. I join the rest of the participants who have thanked you for that eloquent presentation. But mine is a, only one issue, Professor. You have clearly highlighted the timelines of all the constitution making processes and the factors that dictated the outcome of those particular processes. Just want to pick your mind on one issue. Considering the politics of the day, the dynamics obtaining in the country, do we have that political environment that can engender writing a concrete constitution because actually the dichotomy you have given is quite fundamental. A maram constitution and a concrete constitution. And since independence, you have clearly indicated we do not have or we have not had a concrete constitution. All the constitutions we have had are founded on Marab. In my assessment, and considering you have had the submissions of the Honorable Asman Basari, we are talking about impunity reigning supreme in the country, and uh, militarism, the Honorable PPO Ken has also raised. In my own assessment, I just want to pick your mind, but this is my judgment. This is my judgment that as a country, as a nation, we do not have conditions 
that can guarantee writing a new constitution founded on that concrete, uh, anchored on that concrete foundation you're talking about. And uh, wouldn't that again presuppose having another bout of a revolution? Wouldn't that presuppose first changing the foundation, having a paradigm shift, like the Americans when they went to Philadelphia, writing a constitution which has lasted over 200 years, and a couple of other strong democracies? So, in a nutshell, the conditions obtaining in the country, would they allow us to write a constitution, a new one, or even amend it for the benefit of the people, reflect the will of the people, or we have again to first have another revolution so as to be able to create that environment that will help us write the constitution reflecting the wishes and the will of the people. I thank you. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. And uh, can we have the perfect context and the conditions under which we are operating? I think a constitution should put in mind the context of Uganda. That history of constitutional instability and political instability, and considering that Uganda is not yet a nation state, Uganda is a mere geographic expression, as Metanik would put it in the last other centuries. We are not yet a nation state. Even the state is weak. The state is weak. When you tell people that the state is weak, they will tell you, no, it is strong. Why? Because we can suppress opposition, we can suppress dissidents, we can suppress rebels, we can suppress conflicts. That is not the measure of strength of the state. A state is strong because of software, not of hard power. I can give you some examples, uh, moderator, if you don't mind, of state weakness. The issue of ghosts. We have ghost teachers, ghost pensioners, ghost soldiers, ghost land titles, ghost uh, roads, ghost, ghost uh, public, private sector even. It is a ghost. That is an indicator of a weak a state. But also when you go on social media and you see how people exchange, we still are not yet a nation state. So that, that, those are the challenges we should, use. we should look at and craft constitutional provisions that address the question of a weak state and also uniting people. I am glad Mr. Karol Semogere is going to talk about proportional representation. I am a supporter of professional representation. I don't support the winner take all first past the post. It was mooted in 1986. We gave a backing to Semogerere with the researchers, but people just ignored us. They said, ah, those are academic issues. For us, we want a winner take it all, and you can see where the winner take it all is, is taking up. Impunity of Honorable Wasariwa. Yeah, I am saying, I appreciate what you are saying because. Among other things, we are not yet a united country, and we have weak states. For example, we don't follow codes. You had this lady, there is a lady in the UK who is facing it rough. This is lady, the Minister of Interior. Huh? Because she drove past uh, uh, speed, that she drove her car beyond 25 miles per hour instead of 20, and she violated ministerial codes. Just a simple thing like that one. And the Archbishop of Canterbury is also in trouble because he also exceeded state li uh, speed limits. You can see uh, where people uh, follow codes. But here you can break the codes. Uh, but excuse me, members of parliament, when it is also question time, remember to bring out ministers, government officials, military officials who have violated military codes, uh, ministerial codes, and other codes. Just mention it for the public to hear. Political corruption. 
you talked about political uh, you talked about corruption index that political that, that uh, corruption index actually is not important here what is important here is political corruption abuse of public office for political gain not necessarily economic gain for political gain can you please bring up those issues in the parliament people abusing political office for political support gain the constitution should also be an instrument of strengthening the state strengthening the state but otherwise i appreciate the challenges of impunity and parliament should fight impunity most importantly political corruption you have defined corruption minimally to mean embezzlement economic corruption financial corruption you have left out political corruption you should now embark on political corruption put the igg to order to look at political corruption where did we go wrong and we have this maram foundation law whatever and we have got the militarism i somehow talked about the militarism when i said the constitution should be made under civil norms militarism is not only by nrm obote did it in 66 it was somehow done in 67 it was done in, in, in 1995 it was done by the british militarism should be curtailed somehow through enacting making laws and making constitutional provisions against militarism so in the amendment note militarism militarism is not necessarily the military it is the norms and the practice of using the military in the political competition are we saying the constitution alone will solve the problems no we should also go and preach the gospel against using the military in political competition so that we have a military free constitutional making and amendment process i, I agree that the elephant in the room in uganda is the military but quite often when you are discussing constitutional issues democracy issues you leave out to the military for example why is the military still in the parliament the argument about the military being in the parliament i remember was that we are bringing them in to be listening posts to avoid a military takeover did you hear that also huh did you hear that argument was Rutwa overthrown by the military so, sorry was Obote in 1990 in 1985 overthrown by the military yeah are you aware that the, 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 the between 1981 and 85 the military was in the parliament actually they also had 10 representatives the military was there Uite joker was there tito kero was there maybe bazrio was there other military people were there why was the government overthrown so the reason that they are there to stop military coups does not hold water because they were there in 1980s and obote was overthrown so we have to look at the question of militarism the elephant in the room so that we have civil uh, order but the military was not is not used by nrm only it was used in 66 it was used in 67 it has been there and, and 79 we had the military uh realities of uganda some of you are actually pointing out the realities of Uganda. Can we point out these realities of Uganda and address them squarely? Yes. But you are also divided like opposition. The reality of Uganda is that you are also divided. Instead of looking at the, the elephants in the room, you are looking at the, the, the hares in the room. You are looking at the small animals in the room when there are elephants in the room. Can you please sit down, identify the elephants in the room, concentrate on the elephants in the room, and then the other ones are secondary. The primary thing should be elephants in the room. If you want, you can consult us. We shall tell you the elephants in the room. 
and then you prioritize elephants in the room, you stop going for the cats and the uh, and hares and antelopes and rats in the room. There are elephants in the room, and the military is one of them. The political context, I appreciate. Citizens, you see, we don't have citizens in Uganda. Most of Ugandans are still subjects. A citizen is somebody who understands the environment he or she is in and seeks to address it. Can we please conscientize the people so that they are citizens and not merely subjects waiting? In Uganda, you find people sitting on the face. They are always saying, hey, why are you not talking about these things? We no longer hear you. Hey, 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 what are you doing also? Can you be a citizen and not a subject? And if you wait, if you wait for others to do it, in 1980, I was uh, partly, uh, 79, 80, I was in HSC, but I was transferring to the university, and I was in UPM, and we used to say, when we were being constrained from participating in political campaigns, and other people were saying, ah, for us we are going to participate, we would tell them that, giving an analogy, that like if you are in a flat, if you are in an apartment, and you tell people that there is sewage going to bust at point Y, and they refuse, you wait when the, 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 the sewage busts, all of you will be in trouble. So all of us are going to be in trouble, those who are laughing, those who are taking it for granted, those who think the, everything is okay when it's not okay, you wait. When the sewage busts, all of us will, will have the smell. Thank you very much. As I conclude, uh, Madam uh, Moderator, the best constitution, the best constitutions in Africa have been made when the incumbent was weak. I repeat, the best constitutions in independent Africa have been made when the incumbent was weak. Benin has a good constitution because it was made at a time when the incumbent was weak. South Africa was made when actually Dikraka was about to hand over power. He was already weak. Kenya, they made a constitution when Moi was at his weakest. But when you have presidents who are still very strong, and if they don't believe in foundational principles and ethical principles of making a constitution, there is a very big challenge. I am bringing it to you. I am not telling you to give up and say, if we still have somebody who is still strong, strong in the sense that he has got coercive machinery behind him, therefore we should give up. That is not what I'm suggesting. I am saying the struggle continues. I thank you very much. Thank you very much.